Hi there, everyone. My name is Nick. Um, I am a software engineer. Uh, a little bit about me is I am what you would call an open source zealot. Um, unlike RMS, though, I think all open source licenses are pretty good. Um, I don't really care what you use, just open all the things. Um, I've also spoken on NPR's This American Life about how software patents stifle innovation. And I've also led protests here in San Francisco against the NSA. And so my talk today is about uh, con the convergence of the operating system in the browser. And so a quick little clarification, exactly like, what is this guy talking about? Is he talking about swapping out the kernel with a browser? Like, no, 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 absolutely not, right? Uh, what, I'm, what, what I see going forward in the future is uh, we're going to see more and more operating systems going forward where the window manager itself, instead of booting into some kind of desktop environment, it's just going to be a browser, and you're going to see all the applications that make up a, the desktop and all the, the applications that you would use um, being fully rendered in these browser engines. And so here's one of my favorite clips I love to laugh about. I'll create a GUI interface using Visual Basic, see if I can track an IP address. Right, and like, this is fantastic. And I just need to like open up the actual like link for this. I love right down here, it says the, uh, the claim for fair use is this serves an educational purpose in demonstrating computer illiteracy as it pertains to American television. <laughs> I thought that was pretty well done, right? And, and so kind of the idea basically is that, you know, to, to any of us in the room, right, we should be able to distinguish a kernel from a browser Right, but to most end users, they don't give a shit, right? Like they're not going to know what's running it, and they shouldn't have to know what's running it, right? Like the whole argument, native versus HTML, like the user should never have to worry about that, right? And going forward, they're not. And so, just a little bit of history about some of these kind of um, like browser operating system hybrids, right? So back in January, um, Palm, this company, launched something called WebOS. It was actually uh, something really neat, actually, and um, was all used a lot of web technologies uh, for rendering and creating applications, right? And later that year, we had uh, Google announce the Chrome and the Chromium OS operating systems, they, and they published the source code for them. Um, and, and then in 2010, there's a company called uh, Jolie Cloud, I believe. I'm not sure. Maybe that's their application, but they published this Jolie OS, they had their first release, right, um, where users could download this operating system, right, and it booted right into a, a graphical interface that was entirely rendered in a, in a rendering engine. Um, and then in 2011, we have HP acquiring Palm, and later that year, the first Chromebook begins to ship, and then WebOS is kind of halted. And I don't know about anyone else in this room, but that was like a like a real pain in, in, in the heart to see that, right? Because I think so many people had so many great aspirations for WebOS and to kind of hear HP trying to get out of that, it was kind of like a really big bummer, I think, to a lot of people. Luckily, next year, um, Samsung um, announces the first release of Tizen, right, is another one of these operating systems. And Firefox OS, the initial prototype is created. Um, and then finally this year, uh, we have WebOS becomes licensed to Palm, so it's not truly dead. Oh, sorry, that's a typo. It should be licensed to LG. Um, and the first Firefox OS devices begin shipping to consumers in Spain, Poland, Venezuela, and Colombia. And some honorable mentions. So these are all like actual operating systems that you can install on machines, right? Um, these are more of kind of like thin clients, and these are really interesting where it's like a hybrid of like a remote desktop, right? And I know kind of the first thing that I thought of, and, and um, I'm sure many of you have thought of as well, kind of like when I saw Ajax, I thought like, wow, you know, we could actually build a desktop and then just send these requests off and actually maintain what's going on on a back-end server somewhere, right? And so there's so many of these, and one of my favorite ones, there's this really cool one called Symbios, and you can like... It, it's, I don't know, pretty awesome being able to call up a terminal and all kinds of stuff, right? So there's a whole multitude of these that, that you can play with on the list. And so 
Right. I talked about kind of like WebOS having this journey, right, where it started off with Palm. Palm was acquired, and then HP kind of said, like, we don't want to maintain this anymore. LG, you can, like, pay us. I'm not really sure what the deal, the license agreement is, um, but uh, it's kind of disappointing because uh, I think Leo right there dropped the ball on that one. And so, um, and Chrome OS is, is fantastic. It's really great. It's amazing to see it shipping on actual laptops. And I think if you ever get the chance to use one, it, it's pretty inspiring with what the web is capable of doing, right? And, it, and the Chrome team really does a great job. Anything that the web doesn't have, they're really great about patching, patching it in and adding it as a feature and then trying to standardize it. And then Tizen, right? So Tizen has this really crazy like family tree, right? You can see there's like parts, stuff from Nokia, stuff from, uh, from Intel, stuff from the Linux Foundation, and stuff from Samsung, right? And so I don't think Nokia is currently still in the picture with the Tizen organization, um, but you can see kind of like this really interesting uh, hierarchy, right? And so um, I'm very excited for Tizen, right? Like I wanna see the web move forward, especially on mobile devices, um, but we're still waiting for Tizen devices to ship. I don't think at this time any Tizen devices are actually shipping in production. And um, kind of another thing with Chrome OS is like we're seeing it a lot on desktop, but not on mobile devices yet. And this small little ragtag company uh, is working on this thing called Firefox OS, right? Um, and so one of the main benefits of the web, right, when I started learning about these like graphical, um, these like graphical libraries, I, I thought they were all kind of silly because they weren't very portable, right? I kind of, um, I was drawn to the web because of the portability, right? You could generate HTML, CSS, and JavaScript from any other language and then run it everywhere, right? So that that was something that really drew me into the web. Um, and so, you know, kind of one of the, the complaints that I hear the most about the web is that, you know, better apps have better access to hardware, right? And so we end up seeing things, uh, tool chains, right? We end up seeing things like Enyo, which was spun out of kind of like the web OS world. And we have uh, PhoneGap and Cordova, right? And so Here's like a little demo in case you don't know what these things are. I'll probably cut this off because I think... I'm James Long and I work on the apps engineering team. I've been working on adding Firefox OS to Apache Cordova. Cordova, also known as PhoneGap, is a tool that lets you write apps in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and run them on platforms like iOS and Android. I'll show you how it's going so far with the Firefox OS integration. So I have this, app, this Cordova app called FXOS app which I created just by calling Cordova Create FXOS app. And you can see it just has a few directories. Inside the www directory is all of the code for my app. So now I can run Cordova platform add Firefox OS. And it adds the Firefox OS platform. So now if you look inside platforms, you see Firefox OS. And if you dig down in there, you can see the built out app, which runs on Firefox OS. Let's just go ahead and run this in Firefox. So this is kind of the stock app that you get with Cordova Create. I've already added, I've already added this to the Firefox OS simulator, uh, which you can see here. So let's run that in the simulator. So there we go. There is a basic Cordova app running in the simulator. That's not terribly interesting though. Let's uh, add some plugins. Plugins are a way in Cordova which um, allow you to access APIs. Basically every single API, like the device API or the notification API, is an Apache Cordova plugin. So you do that by saying Cordova plugin add, and I'm going to add the dialog plugin, which essentially is notifications. And now if I go into my Cordova app, and I access the notification API by saying navigator.notification.alert, um, I can say Cordova prepare, which builds out the app. And if I rerun it in the simulator, you can see that you can see there's a notification. It just says, welcome to Cordova. The styling of this is probably going to be improved. Let's access another API. If I say Cordova plugin. Right, so I'll cut that a little short, right? So what we end up seeing, right, is that there's these tool chains that come out. And anytime a new platform wants to come along, it's like, hey, why don't you patch yourself into this? 
Um, and then the owners of these tool chains go to great lengths to try and get you to buy into their tool chains. And like, I don't know about everyone else, but doesn't this feel a little backwards? Like, that's what standards are, are for, right? We should be creating um, standards, really, for all of these things, right? The browser should be able to be first class on all of these platforms. And if it's not, we should demand better from our browser vendors. If they have public bug trackers, you should file an issue and CC the CEO of the corporation and say, hey, I can't do this. I want to be able to do it, right? Even if he closes the bug and says, sorry, I can't help you, he knows it's an issue. It's going to be sitting in the back of his head, and he, they're going to know that it's a problem, right? And so that's what we're trying to do within the W3C, specifically the System Applications Working Group, right? So most of these APIs are in the stable draft or last call portion of standardization. Um, they're targeted for first two quarters of 2014 to become candidate recommendations, and then a finally a recommendation is when something is a full standard. Um, and so what's been interesting is that as part of Firefox OS, Mozilla has been adding a bunch of, uh, working on a bunch of these APIs, and what's interesting is that Samsung has actually been patching them into WebKit, so they are becoming standard. Um, so one of the things I said is kind of be apprehensive about tool chains, right? Like, this should just work in the web. And here's something that Mozilla's been working on um, that I feel is kind of more how things should be. Let me open this full screen. There we go. In this video, we'll see how open web apps from Firefox OS can work on any platform where Gecko is available, and how we've made them feel like native apps on each platform. On Firefox OS, users can discover apps in the Firefox Marketplace and install them directly onto the phone's home screen. Here's Shot Clock, an open web app for computing sun angles for outdoor photographers. It's written entirely in HTML and JavaScript. Let's find out how much work it will take to run it on other platforms. Android users discover apps in the Firefox Marketplace. Marketplace has approved Shot Clock for use on Android, so we just click Install as we did on Firefox OS. We automatically repackage open web apps as native Android apps to give our users a native app experience. Here's Shot Clock running on Android, just like a native app. How much code did the app developer rewrite? Zero. Because we installed it from an Android APK, we can manage it from the recent app list. And we find it in the app drawer, like every other app. Windows users discover apps in the Firefox Marketplace using Desktop Firefox. Marketplace has approved Shot Clock for laptops too, so we just click Install. We automatically repackage the open web app as a native Windows app. Here's Shot Clock running on Windows, just like a real app. How much code did the app developer rewrite? Zero. That means that users can launch their open web apps from the Start menu, and quit them from the file menu. They can also uninstall open web apps from the program's control panel. Mac OS X users also discover apps in the Firefox marketplace using desktop Firefox. We automatically repackage the open web app as a native Mac OS X app. We installed Shot Clock in the Applications folder, and it launches and runs just like a real app. How much code did the app developer rewrite? Zero. So far, we've looked at unprivileged apps. We will also support privileged apps on all these platforms. Here is Kitchen Sync, our app for testing the Firefox OS privileged APIs. The experience of discovering and installing is the same as before, but now we follow the Android convention of presenting a list of permissions to the user at install time. 
These permissions are copied from the Open Web App Manifest. After the user completes the installation process, the app is ready to use. So here's the Kitchen Sink app accessing the Android hardware. How much code did this app developer rewrite? Zero. This is hard to visualize vibration. Oh, and one more thing. You know that email app that comes with your Firefox OS phone? Marco Castelluccio, our Open Web Apps intern, installed it on his laptop. He copied over the app package from Gaia and made one tweak to the app manifest. How much application code did he rewrite? Zero. So, if you like the apps that come with your Firefox OS phone and want to run them on your other devices, cross-platform open web apps can make that happen. Right, and so this basically is zero tool chains. If Firefox is installed on one of these platforms, this works today. Um, I think we could probably do a better job of marketing that and letting developers know about it. Um, but one of the things that's really kind of like meta that I'm thinking is totally possible with this is if you can install any open web app from Firefox OS on Android, but Firefox OS, actually Gaia, the user interface itself, is just a web app, could you install Gaia itself as a web app on Android and actually have an application where you launch it and suddenly your phone is running Firefox OS and actually have an operating system running within an operating system? Uh, so that's an interesting thought experiment, and I think... Uh, we might try and put a hack together like that to see if we could do that. Um, and so another really common thing that I hear a lot is that, you know, JavaScript doesn't have the performance of native. And what's really interesting is most of the people who make this argument aren't actually writing code where this matters, right? Like, unless you're writing a, a kernel or possibly a, a game engine, a really big game engine, most of the time this really doesn't matter. Um, in fact, we have some really neat demos that to show you of the performance of JavaScript. And so this was put together by my friend Alon Zakai. He's the maintainer of the mscripten uh, compiler, which compiles C and C++, uh, uses Clang as the front end of the compiler, and then mscripten is the back end of the compiler, and that submits JavaScript. And so we'll load up this demo. I'll just run it on low resolution for now. By 2004, the internet had become a part of everything. So life. this is the game Banana Bread. I don't know if you may have seen this demo before in the past, um, but this is all using WebGL, right? And so one of the things we can do in WebGL is we can add textures to different objects, and we can do things uh, using, we can say use videos for textures, or we can use web pages. For instance, this is pulling down tweets with a, with a, um, hashtag of Moss Summit, because this is a demo from that. And then over here, I don't know if anyone recognizes this, um, but this is Doom. And so I'm going to play Doom while I... Oh, sorry. I'm going to play Doom while I play this game. So we'll add some bots into Banana Bread. Ah, oh, shit. And I'm going to play... Yeah, I got him. Yeah, so that's that's one of our demos, right? So Doom itself, right, there's this port, uh, PR Boom, I think it's called. is like a more portable version of the original source code. And um, so that was compiled uh, to JavaScript as well. And something that we announced earlier is working with Epic on porting the Unreal Engine 3 to JavaScript. And so I'll, I'll load up this demo. Um, I'm not sure if you may have seen this already or not before, but... So this is uh, Unreal Engine 3 running entirely in JavaScript. And so as kind of a demo for their engine, right, for anyone who's looking to uh, kind of like run the demo on a new platform, right, they provide the Citadel. And you can, uh, I think you can like, look around. I'm not sure what the controls are. Oh, there we go. And why don't we benchmark it and do a fly through? Right, and so we're using request animation frame here. 
Um, we're getting, it looks like 50 to 60 frames a second. Uh, one of the things that was interesting was at GDC, we actually had a box with a special build of Firefox where request animation frame did not cap the frame rate at 60. And so this demo is running at about like 200 frames a second on that box, which is pretty interesting. Um, so just imagine, right, like how many games do you play on consoles that use the Unreal Engine, right? And imagine all of those being able to run in the browser, right? So it's just up to the, the companies that publish these to decide, you know, we want the web to be a platform. So if you ask them, please, can we have the web be a platform? You'll start seeing all the, these AAA titles running in the browser. And so I would recommend that you look forward to future developments in this area. So one of the things though, right, this argument can go on forever about performance this, performance that, but the hard line is, is that there is no shared memory between threads and JavaScript, right? You have these workers, which are your threading abstractions, and they can post messages back and forth, and there's a slight overhead to using them, um, but it's not as fast as just having shared memory. But things get very dangerous when we start trying to share memory between threads. And uh, there is no inline assembly, so you won't be writing a browser kernel. So if your friends get into arguments about performance with JavaScript, there is a bottom line, and that's where it is right now. And so let's talk about mobile today, right? Um, so the next couple of slides, uh, I was kind of inspired by the first keynote here. I thought it was a little strange. It made me scratch my head a little bit. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Android, right? And so... If we look at this graph, right, we can see that it looks like Symbian was king for a while, and then it bled market share, it's down to zero, and now Android is close to 80%, right? That's pretty wild. But there's some really interesting reasons for why I wouldn't bet on Android, right? And so one of the things that they let slip during their patent litigation with Oracle is that Google actually loses significant revenue, uh, money on Android by maintaining it. Um, sorry, the second article has a very strongly worded title, I would say, but it has some very interesting points about um, kind of the litigation that, that Google wants, right? Like whenever you have something, everyone else wants a piece of the pie. And so Microsoft and Apple have also um, won some litigation suits against Google, and they actually make quite a bit of money, uh, in some cases more than Google itself does, which is kind of interesting. And one of the things I find really interesting is that Google earns 80% of its mobile revenue from iOS, just 20% of Android, right? And so as Android kind of takes market share away from Google, they actually lose more and more money, right? It's super ironic. Um, another thing that I find kind of ironic is that Andy Rubin, uh, who was in charge of Android at Google for a while and uh, its upbringing, is now out and is no longer in charge of the project, actually, Sundar Pinchai is, uh, who is the head of their Chrome OS team. So I find that very interesting. And I'm curious if Sundar will try and merge the two projects or not. Um, another thing I find interesting is that Google's Chromecast may have its roots in Android, but it uses Chrome as a brand, right? It's not Android Cast, it's Chromecast. It has the, the name brings back uh, the thoughts of like the web, right? And I would say it's hardly Android, right? Just sharing, so not having Bionic or Dalvik uh, barely makes it Android at that point. I'd say sharing device drivers, you might as well call Firefox OS based on Android than by having similar device drivers, right? Um, and another thing is that Symbian went from 60%, a majority in the market, to nothing, right? So this could happen to anyone. Um, Another reason why I wouldn't bet on Android is Samsung, right? So Samsung is the best-selling handset manufacturer, but they're working on Tizen right now, right? Tizen, they have not shipped a single phone, but they are already developing alternative applications to all of Google's uh, kind of shipped first-party applications, right? And so I'm not saying this will happen. It's a huge, tremendous if. But what would happen if Samsung one day just said, we're not shipping any more Galaxy devices. We're going to go entirely with Tizen. What would that do for the Android ecosystem? And just to put that in perspective, you may see that 80% and think, wow, game over, right? Like, why would anyone new join the fray? 80%, that's, that's game over, right? 
Like, there is no room for anyone new, right? Um, well, just to put it into perspective, right, um, it's really hard to, to get these numbers right, so these are really rough estimates. Um, but assuming the number of smartphone users in the world is 1 to 1.6, with 1.6 being very conservative, and a, about 7.1 billion people on Earth times an 80% market share, that means there's only 11 to 18% of people on Earth using an Android device and not much more even using smartphones, right? So there's tremendous room for growth in this industry. Um, another thing I want to speak about, so getting off the talk about Android, is platforms without MMAP um, or the equivalent system call, right? And so when you have a high-performance JavaScript engine, right, it has a JIT compiler that's generating code on the fly and then executing it, you need a system call to be able to ask the operating system, can you please allocate virtual memory for me that I can then that I then have the permission to execute? And so if your platform doesn't allow this, then uh, at least to user land code, then there can no there cannot be any other JIT compiler than the one you offer, right? So I talked about Android. Well, number two and number three don't offer this. And so that's why if you see other operating systems, they're just kind of like the UI wrapper around the existing JavaScript implementation, which may be a third or fourth place. And I wrote up a really simple JIT on my blog. That's that link. If you want to learn a little bit about how they work, I've distilled it down to like the three or four um, functions you need to call. So I want to talk a little bit about what's the battle plan, right? Like how do we get HTML5 um, to be bigger than anything that exists today? And so I think, I've already spoken about device APIs, right? We're working on standardizing them. They're not out yet. We kind of have these tool chains, but to me they feel like band-aids, right? So once we have the standardized device APIs, that will go a long way. Um, I think I talked a little bit about performance. Um, with JavaScript, we're seeing so much competition in the JavaScript VM space. That's such a good thing, right? And we need to keep having this competition. Um, it broke my heart when Opera kind of bowed out of the race because that's less competition, right? We need more competition, not, not less. Um, another thing we need are rocking developer tools. Um, so uh, I'm going to show a quick demo. Um, it's very reminiscent. I don't know if anyone saw the talk the Amazon guys gave yesterday, but they have some really cool stuff. Um, so definitely good job, uh, those guys. But the browser's not open source, so eh. <laughs> All right, so one of the new developer tools that's been added in Firefox Nightly is something called um, the App Manager, right? And so what I can do when I'm debugging an application, right, is frequently I'll write just in, job, in, in Firefox itself and use the responsive design view in making sure my app looks great on mobile screens and full screen. Um, but this is more for testing applications on, on device itself, right? So what I have here is... What I have here is a really interesting application. Um, so one of the device APIs, I, I don't know if, if anyone caught that, but there's something, a new one being added in standardized called raw sockets. I think the name's a little misleading because raw sockets are di different than standard sockets, but again, that's probably getting too technical. Um, so there's actually going to be APIs for working with TCP and UDP from JavaScript itself. And so what I did was I took Node IRC is a, a library for Node that handles the, the IRC protocol and is already well tested and is probably better than anything I could write. And I took it and I ported it to Firefox OS using this raw socket API that we've already implemented. Um, so I'm going to demo that uh, for everyone. Um, so w one of the things I want to show first is that if you don't have a Firefox OS device, we have a simu simulator, and you saw that already in James's video, right? So you can pick which version of Firefox OS you want to run, and from the simulator, now we can ah, still connecting. Interesting. Sorry. So this is very cutting edge technology. There. Oh, no. 
This is very new technology and I'm not sure that this demo will be perfect. Okay, so there we go, now we have a connection, right? So we can update or basically install the app and we see right here that the app was installed and I can click debug to actually run it, right? And so this is uh, an IRC application uh, that I wrote, essentially taking this giant library and making it use the raw sockets API, maybe adding about 30 lines of code to do that and just wrapping UI around that, right? Um, so what I think is more exciting though is there, if you actually do have a device and um, so what you can do with any Firefox OS device is connect it and at the bottom here you can see that this developer tool recognized this as a key on, right? So what I can do is I can click uh, connect to the key on and on the screen here it's going to ask me to connect. Um, I think what I'll do here is I wrote a little mirror, right? So all this does is, this is, uses a new API called Get User Media. If you want to check out the source for this, it's actually nice and tiny. This is all I wrote for it. There's no libraries in here, right? All I do is you shim it out for based on vendor prefixes, which is something that I hate, drives me crazy. Um, and then you call it and you pass it in objects, specifying whether or not you want audio, video, um, and then a on success callback and a non error callback. And so you can see what I'm doing is I'm getting a reference to the video element that's already in the DOM. I'm setting its source to a URL that I created based on the stream. And then on, uh, on the loaded metadata, uh, I think maybe the earliest event that fires for this element, but I'm not certain on that. I just call play on the video element, right? So this is using my webcam live right now. And so I'll try and hold up my phone and run the demo too. Uh, sorry, it's not perfect, but so when I clicked connect down here, this little uh, prompt popped up saying an incoming message to, for remote debugging, would you like to enable this? And I say, okay. So now what I can do is, if we look at my app screen, is I don't have this app installed. And so I'll, what I'll do is I'll click update and it takes about a second or two. Oh, sorry, I didn't connect. Oops. Okay. There we go. Okay. And if I click update. Hey, it was installed, right? And so now I have this app that I was able to push from my desktop to the phone itself. And then if I click debug, it's going to launch the application and our dev tools, right? Tremendous work has been going on at Mozilla in re-architecting our dev tools to work remotely. And so even when you're running dev tools locally, it's just binding over a, a socket to localhost, which is kind of interesting. And so here we have a, a JavaScript console, which would show different things, right? Um, but one of the things I think is really cool um, is the inspector, right? And so one of the things you can do, uh, in the past you've been able to click this select an element with the mouse, and then within the desktop, go and click on the element you want and it highlights it in the inspector. What I can do instead is click on it here and then click on an element that I want. Oh, sorry, I touched the screen. So let's click on this, see this button? And so the inspector just jumped to that button, right? And so what we can do is, why don't we live edit what's on the phone? So let's make the connect button instead be a self-destruct button. Bam, and you can see it just jumped on the phone. And as I highlight uh, different uh, nodes in the inspector, you can see it highlight them actually on the device itself. And so one of the things that I find very interesting, right, I'll close out of this, um, is not only can you do this with your own apps, but all the apps on the device are written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The home screen itself is an application, right? So why don't we live edit the home screen app? <laughs> so again, uh, this is a little tricky, but let's see if we can debug the home screen, right? Okay, and then let's take our pointer and let's pick an icon just to, okay, so we jump to the icon and then we can see our CSS rules that are being applied to it. Um, why don't we add a transform? Um, what do we want to do? Let's do a rotate. 
And let's turn everything by 90 degrees. Oh, did you see a jump? <laughs> right? So th what's awesome about this is it, it, it live edits. So as soon as it, it parses a valid CSS rule, you'll see it jump ready. So I remove the G. I'm just going to punch the G in real quick, and bam, it flipped, right? And so, um, I don't know, what's another? 45 degrees. Sure, we'll do <laughs> rotate. 45. Oh, units, degrees, there you go, perfect, right? So like, how cool is this, right? I can imagine, right, like my little cousins who think they're hackers because they, they like jailbreak their iPhone, like little kids could edit their operating system. Like, how crazy is this? You could view source and edit live on your phone. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's that would act, that's doable. That's to, you could totally do that. Um, it's more code than I care to write right now, but it's totally doable, right? And so, like for instance, if we fired back up my IRC application, oh, interesting. I guess I have to stay like this. Like one of the things we can do is, I don't know. Let's say I grab uh, the card and I want to change like the background image, right? Like this gradient from. That kind of like blue to white might be hard to see, I'm sorry. But you can see here that, so I have RGBs, it's going from white to black, right? And I can start changing it to red. So 25 for the red value isn't that red, it's still closer to black, but the second I add another five, it instantly updates on the phone, right? So this is uh, what we've been really hard working on uh, for our dev tools to get this up and running. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. And so um, going back to my presentation now, I'm so happy that that worked. Oh, man. <laughs> right, so going forward, what's it going to take for HTML5 to be the king of mobile? Right, more device APIs, consistent performance improvements, rocking developer tools, Partnering with carriers and handset manufacturers, because if they jump ship, who's going to build you a device or who's going to sell a device to consumers? And we need to be, target growing markets, right? The current U.S. smartphone market is oversaturated. It's going to be very difficult for new players to enter it, right? We kind of saw this a little bit with the Ubuntu Touch, right? Targeting super high end, right? Is already a market that's essentially dominated, in my opinion, by Apple, right? So we need to be targeting growing markets, markets where users have not even seen the internet yet. Like, think about that. Um, there's parts of the world where building out the last mile of internet is so expensive. The only way these people are ever going to see the internet is through wireless, right? Wireless cellular radios are going to provide, uh, they provide significantly cheaper last mile connections to hundreds of thousands of people, millions, billions of people. So the next two billion people that come online, it's going to be on mobile. So this is very important. And so at this point, I want to invite audience feedback. What are some other things that HTML needs in order to be king? So this was my big problem with WebOS. They had tons of money. They should have commissioned several of the biggest, awesome, popular apps that users care about to be built and just pay it out of their own pocket because the problem is developers aren't going to flock to a platform until users have already flocked. Right. To Top content is very important, right? In order for any of these web platforms to succeed, we're going to need the, the top applications, right? Say maybe top 100 worldwide and top 500 in individual markets in order for someone to actually want to go out and purchase one of these devices, right? Um, so that's very important. Um, but I would say more so in, in markets where people have, you know, they've had this, these experiences before, like they have a desktop computer with internet. That way, when they move to mobile, they don't feel like something's been taken away, right? But if someone's never seen the internet before, it, it's not as, as big of an issue. But having the top content is going to be important for taking over the whole world, right? It's not just build it and they will come. They have to come first before a lot of developers will build it. Exactly. So what else can HTML do to help take over the world? Faster API cycles. Building them quicker. I think the standardization process is very slow, right? That's why we have these kind of band-aids, right? Because they're near-term solutions. Uh, over here? Are there APIs for push notifications? Uh, yes, that's uh, being standardized, push notifications are. 
Uh, so being able to alert users, right, uh, when, they're, they're at, when their phone falls asleep, right, because now we're dealing with these mobile connections, right, is very important. And it's frequently something that we don't always think about, especially when we develop on the desktop, right? The desktop is the perfect use case, right? You have the fastest processors and you have near unlimited bandwidth. And those are not, and you're always connected. And those are not the case on mobile, right? So those are important issues uh, that we need to think about as developers going forward. How, how do we work around these? How do we take them into account? Uh, others, how else can we take over the world? Come on, I couldn't have nailed everything. A gold Firefox phone. <laughs> I can see the appeal, yes. Um, okay, so if uh, there's no further battle, oh, yes. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. That that demo is really slick. I'd I'd love to see that that um, working across all browsers. That'd be really fantastic. Um, definitely, first mover advantage is, is huge, right? Especially in growing markets. Um, there's also I forget the term, but uh, the kind of the second in market can always come along and usurp, usurp the first if they have a better product, right? So yeah, right here. So you don't have to load libraries on the rest. So OpenCV, you should have an API that accesses it so you can do eye tracking without a lot of... Totally. That would be so awesome to have a CV API in, built into the browser itself. In the back here, I think I saw a hand. Yeah? No? I was just going to emphasize lower kind of development costs. Right. So I kind of talked about this is that, you know, there is no developer program for the web, Right. Like, the web is, is free, right? Like, any kid can fire up, you know, Notepad and write HTML and then just sit there and hit Control-R and see their updates and stuff, right? We need to keep this affordable. And any tool sets especially need to be affordable. Over here? Better integration with GPU. Yes, yes. We need better performance for WebGL all around. I think it's fantastic. And I think there's certainly m much more improvements that can be made with the GL bindings. for DOM and CSS, too. Sure, hardware acceleration is becoming huge. Better concurrency, right? So this is kind of the issue I got into with like this, these threading primitives. Um, I think there's a very specific use case for it, but I think going forward, that use case is gonna enable tons and tons of, of new applications. Right here. Standardization for sound and video codecs. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. <laughs> Sorry, so for repeating for the camera, it was the standardization of sound and video codecs. Um, yes, uh, in order to be able to distribute content, we need something, we need everything to remain free. And I'm not going to talk any bit more about that. Uh, is there a hand over here? Yes. I think there's so much awesome competition going on in the realm of developer tools. Um, I think the next crazy thing that I might even propose around that is maybe even like standardizing developer tools. That way, when one platform adds awesome developer tools, you can use it across browser. That's some like crazy far out idea, but how sick would that be if we had that, right? Um, any others? Yeah, right here. Um, well, I, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, you showed some sort of um, integration with the OS or standalone the executables, not necessarily applications running within uh, a browser. Um, could you, for example, uh, or the suggestion would be uh, more integration with the underlying operating system? I don't know what the, the state is right now. Could you do, for example, a file manager in using HTML? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's... It, yeah. Um, and, yeah, I think packaged apps and the concept of packaged apps are still uh, kind of strange and kind of alien, and I feel like they're uh, like another Band-Aid, like a temporary solution. So I look forward to their demise. All right, um, moving forward, are there any questions that anyone has for me? Uh, we only have like six minutes, so. Uh, when you showed the remote debugging, uh, the inertial profile tab, does that work on the 
Yes, the remote profiler does. I have no idea how to read it, uh, but it's implemented. It's one of the newer Firefox OS, uh, Firefox dev tools. Um, and so, yeah, you can totally profile your app with it. Am I ever going to be able to just put Firefox OS on my own phone and still be able to make calls from my carrier, or do I have to wait for the carriers to agree? Um, I don't know about that. I don't know that the carriers necessarily know even like what you're running on the end, right? Kind of just like the web itself is anonymous, where you can use curl and fake all the headers and no one knows that you're actually going through a proxy server, that you're not in the country your headers appear to be from, um, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I know some of the hardest things with porting Firefox OS to new devices are device-specific drivers, right? Many of those are not open source, and so when they don't work correctly, you can't even go in and fix them, which really sucks. Uh, so this phone is a GSM phone. So I have a SIM card for T-Mobile. I use uh, whatever the Walmart thing is, but it goes through T-Mobile anyways. Um, and I think AT&T, a lot of folks test on AT&T. So it's up to the carrier actually what their cellular technology is, right? So CDMA is not gonna work with this phone but that's not an actual limitation of the operating system. That's entirely up to the handset manufacturer, whether or not they install uh, a 3G radio that uses GSM or a 3G radio that uses CDMA, or maybe they make one that does both. But I'm, I think that might be cost prohibitive. Could one get a Firefox phone today? Uh, yeah, uh, so um, Mozilla itself doesn't distribute phones, right? Just like the Linux kernel, they don't actually distribute Linux, right? There's distributions. And so while we maintain the operating system, you have to go to uh, the handset manufacturers to purchase the phones. So um, any developer phones, there's uh, this company called Geeks Phone. It's a Spanish company that's selling phones. And also on eBay, ZTE is selling ZTE Opens. Okay, uh, if there's no further questions, thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. Please let me know what you thought of this talk on Twitter. My handle is Lost Oracle. Totally feel free to let me know it sucks. Like, I'm totally cool with that, but if you do, tell me why it sucked, right? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, check out my blog. I try to always have really awesome, like, programming content on there. Um, and thank you very much for attending my talk. I really appreciate it.